Welcome to Pardon the Corruption. Joining me today is Oren Weisfeld. Hey, man. Hey, man. How's it going? I'm going. I'm. I'm doing all right. I mean, uh, a loss to uh, the Pelicans to start the seasons off uh, is not the greatest way to start the season off, especially if it's a home loss. Um, and as I as I was watching that game, I think even in the first quarter, what what dawned on me was that we were really struggling to rebound the ball uh, right from the get go. Uh, Baines, Boucher. Uh, these guys just were not able to keep up with Zion on the on the glass, and just the, the, just the amount of activity the Pelicans generate underneath the hoop, the Raptors had a little little trouble with. And at the end, we were like minus ten on the glass. And man, you know, basketball sometimes is a pretty simple sport. Man, you got to score and you got to rebound. And when you don't rebound, you run into a lot of trouble. Am I overblowing the rebounding? Um, issues by calling them out so early? Do you think it's an actual issue or do you think this is something that's going to uh, sort itself out? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, it is weird seeing the Raptors lose. We're not used to that. So last night sucked, but I will say that was a much more well-organized Pelicans team than the one we played at the start of last season. Um, but I'm not ready to say that there's a rebounding issue quite yet. Um, that team is obviously designed to crash the boards, like having a, Z- a front court of Zion and, Steven Adams is obviously just going to demolish in general, most teams on the boards. Um, But I will say that the Raptors losing Serge and Mark screwed with their depth. Like one of their best aspects of of the last two years teams really were the fact that they were so versatile and flexible. They could play in a multitude of ways. And that might've been an example where nurse would have went to like a big front court with Mark and Serge, if we had them. But now the way the team is structured, we just don't have that option, really. We have Baines at the five, or we have Boucher at the five, or obviously OG at the five, and we can talk about that later. Um, but we don't we don't really have like a mega lineup or like the flexibility to play different ways. And yeah, they they ate us up on the boards. Uh, but I'm not I'm not ready to say it's a concern quite yet. Yeah. Well, Alex Len is also there to help out with with some size in the in the front court. Uh, but overall, I, I, I guess you're right. I mean, the, the Pelicans are a big team underneath, and, and we should sort of expect the Raptors to struggle with these uh, with these bigger lineups. And I, I think uh, we, I talked about it in, in the last uh, PTC. It was that I think throughout the season we're going to discover just what a drop in depth and talent we've suffered in the front court because we have lost two. Top, top, t- and no matter what you thought of Gasol in the postseason and you know how he struggled in, against the Celtics, we have lost like formidable players. And what we saw last night, we're probably going to see a few times again in the Eastern Conference when you go up against some of these bigger teams. I agree. And, and another thing I'll say is that one thing that surprised me is like usually what the Raptors are able to do really well is get out and run against teams that cr- crash the offensive boards. And last night, our transition game just wasn't there compared to what we're used to seeing. Like a staple of Raptors teams has been just like easy buckets in transition throughout the game. That's what like keeps the offense rolling. And like, even though the Pelicans were crashing the boards, when we did get the rebound, we just weren't able to like smoothly run out and like get something to happen enough. And that's, that's going to be an issue. Like it's really early in the season. So I really think they will iron a lot of this stuff out. I'm not too worried. There was a lot of good stuff from last night, but one thing that was clearly missing was like, they had a focus on the half court, it seemed, but they didn't have that same ability to play in transition and then only rely on the half court when they had to. Yeah. And with, with transition, I mean, you can't really play transition basketball if you don't have the rebound. Like if you're not a good defensive rebounding team and, and you, and the person rebounding the ball has good vision, like Mark Gasol and Ibaka, but Gasol obviously to a much larger degree, but after you get the ball to kick that transition off that first pass out of the, out of the back court is key to spark anything off. And again, not having great rebounding just hampers your transition game in general. And when you look at our overall front court depth, there's, man, there's not much there after you go Baines, Boucher, Len, and you're really searching for, now at this point, you're asking like, you know, your stretch guys to play big positions. For sure. And I'm not even confident that you can trust Boucher or Len in, mm-hmm. in like end of game situations. Like William Liu wrote about in his like eight bold predictions column that. 
Baines is the only center that we'll see playoff minutes. And I, I agree as of right now that that's probably how it looks like Boucher is nice. And he was giving you really good offense, uh, especially in the first half yesterday, but he's never been, he's never proven that you can play at the end of games. And Nick hasn't even trusted him to put him in those situations to see if he can, you know, so that that's how far he is from, from being in that situation. Len right now is like the 12th man. Uh, it doesn't look like he's going to get in there unless there's injuries as of right now. So yeah, there's, there's a depth concern for sure. Like that's to me, the only real reason that this team is, is worse than last year's team. It's not necessarily because the top end talent is worse. It's because the, the different ways you can play, there's, there's fewer of them and people want to talk about small ball, but small ball is so matchup dependent. Like, Small ball is not going to work against half of the East best teams. It's only going to work in like a few different series. So I think, I think it's something the Raptors probably will have to address whether it's at the trade at deadline or next off season, but I'm willing to give them a little more time, especially in terms of rebounding. I'm not sure Baines is a worse rebounder than Gasol. And so I think we had rebounding problems last year. And I think we're just about as bad as we were then. Yeah, I, 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 I'll take uh, I'll counter you on the uh, how far back Boucher is behind uh, Baines. I mean, obviously, Boucher is raw, to, as raw as you can be. Um, but w- w- what I do like about Boucher's game is that he is fairly confident in trying to hit that uh, mid-range jumper. We saw it against the Pelicans as well, where after the initial screen, and the, and the Raptors did do a much better job, or j- just a generally good job of getting into their half-court sets much earlier. You didn't really see too many like late shot clock situations where you're heaving up bad shots, which was which was a ca- kind of a so something that happens to you when you go up against good defenses. I think so. Credit to them for actually getting into their offense fairly quickly. But but with Boucher. I do like the fact that he has that elbow jumper in him because that really opens up o- opens up the game a little and kind of reminds you of how Ibaka used to operate with Lowry and Van Vliet by going into that elbow area. And as I've been, you know, kind of saying the last little bit, the mid-range game sort of is coming back. And to see Boucher kind of quick do that quick fire elbow jumper, that could be a play that might earn him some more minutes in general, maybe not surpass um, Bain just because of Bain's screen setting, but just kind of edging into his playing time a little bit. I think, I think he could, he could cut into it. Yeah. Yeah. I think Baines reminds me a lot of Gasol and, and Boucher reminds me a lot of Ibaka. But with that being said, like, like in the sense that Boucher's biggest strength is his offense. And so was Ibaka's They're They're very similar, but defensively, I think Ibaka was a lot better than Boucher. I think Boucher has a long way to go because if, if the only way he's staying on the floor is his offense, that can only get you so far in any team, especially this nurse coached version of the Raptors. Like as soon as he sees a mistake, he's very easy to pull guys who make mistakes on the defensive end. And Boucher is still willing to bite on pump fakes and all that stuff. But I will say last night was one of his better games overall. Mm -hmm. And if he's going to slowly continue to improve on both ends and adding like that short roll jumper is is definitely it does open the floor up a lot for his teammates. Then yeah, I see no reason why he can't play as many minutes as Baines. Baines is also an older man, like he's thirty four. Like 20, 25 minutes a game max is is like the most he should be playing. And last night and in the preseason, he's looked tired early. Yeah. Um. Uh, let's switch to some some other topics from this week. Um, I mean, the Harden thing is making the rounds. Uh, the Raptors being one of the few teams that have like, called him up. And uh, immediately, as soon as that discussion comes up, I mean, you talk about Siakam right there. And then you go, because he would have to be the minimum probably that goes the other way, you would imagine. And whenever you talk about that, you always start comparing where Harden is today and where Siakam could be in the future. And those are like, and, and those conversations are not indictments against Siakam. It's a natural question to ask when you're evaluating a potential trade. If you leave Harden's off-court issues or whatever aside, which to me are frankly boring, but as a player, he he is an elite offensive player. He is an elite scorer. And I don't think there's a guy in this league who can stop him from getting 30 a game. Um, and you you weigh that against uh, Siakam's ceiling. I guess the open question, and this is so, by the way, after the Raptors game or during the Raptors game, I was also watching the Bucks, uh, the Bucks and Celtics, 
and watching Tatum and Jalen Brown go off on uh, on Milwaukee. And yeah. you, you start to compare players naturally. And, and it, it, it kind of, I guess the question I'm asking is, where do you think Siakam's ceiling is? Like, if you had to rank, like, okay, let's start with Brown, Tatum, and Siakam. Who, which yeah. of those three have the highest ceiling? Tatum, for sure. Tatum's, uh, he's special. Uh, but but I, I think Siakam's ceiling is higher than Brown's, personally. So, so, so the Raptors are, in, I guess, in a, if this trade actually, you know, is, is real talk, then they're in a better position to offer uh, Houston a, a package than, than Boston because Boston's kind of willing to give up Jalen Brown. Would you, would you look into this trade? And before you answer, I just want to say this is the exact same situation that sort of landed as Kawhi. Unhappy superstar looking for a scenery change. It's not often that number one guys come onto the trade market. I think Anthony Davis sort of came on like last year, maybe. It's it's not something that happens very frequently at all. So when this opportunity comes up, do you, Oren Weisfeld, pounce on it? Yeah, this is, a, I have a lot of thoughts on this. This is something I've gone back and forth about writing about, but haven't yet because I didn't really know how real the Harden rumors were until like yesterday, Mark Stein reported it. So then I was like, oh, Okay, I guess they're kind of real that the Raptors are are talking about it. But yeah, like it is the same and it isn't. So would I trade Pascal for Harden like a straight up one-on-one swap? Yes, but it it's it's a more complicated situation than that because this isn't the same as the DeMar for Kawhi thing for a number of reasons. One of them is the DeMar team had reached its ceiling. You know, it got to the playoffs several times. And then in the last version, it got swept by the Cavs. It's like that front office was clearly like, okay, this team has reached a ceiling. We're going to make changes. Whereas this core, you can't say the same thing about. They've had one run in which they were unsuccessful and it was in a bubble in a pandemic. You know, I'm not going to like say that this core has reached its ceiling, although they do look like they're a piece short. Um, The other thing is the contract situation. DeMar had two years left. Um, Pascal has four or five. So those are the differences uh, right off the bat. I don't think Pascal will ever, obviously, it goes without saying he's not going to reach hard in ceiling, but I am higher on Pascal's ceiling than most, uh, simply because his his career progression isn't like most players. You can't pigeonhole him and say he is 26, so therefore he's reached his peak. Like, no, he yet last season was his first season ever at the helm of an offense. And all things considered, he did really well up until the bubble. So I'm going to give him at least one more season before I can say like what his ceiling definitively is. And a lot of good things already this preseason and this season, like his shot, like he looks so confident shooting the ball when people go under screens, he's getting to the rim. Like still, I get people want him to get to the rim even more, but if he can go around Zion, you know, that's not an easy thing to do. And, and Pascal is one of the very few people in the world who can do that consistently. So yeah, I would do that trade one-on-one, but when you think about it, like in a little more detail, it gets more complicated because if we get, if we go Pascal for Harden, you have a very imbalanced roster. So that's why I would do it one for one, because you still have the picks to deal with to balance the roster. But if you're giving your whole future, like three first round picks, two pick swaps, Norman Powell, Terrence Davis, Pascal, then it's like, okay, now we have a really imbalanced roster and we have no way to get any, you know, like sustained, like help at the center position. We have a lot of trust in OGN and OB to play the four and the three, like huge minutes. And I'm not sure the only way you're doing that trade is if you know, you're getting a title contender out of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it is complicated. Like that roster is so imbalanced to me that I think then you need to move Fred probably to get a wing back because people forget Houston's a main problem that Houston had in their years with Harden, not reaching the finals is they never had a wing who could buy his own shot. And that's important in the playoffs and and Pascal say what you will about him. He can do that with some regularity. So that's why I'm hesitant. I'm hesitant, but yeah, yeah. I, I think it's uh, it's if you if you do make that one for one trade, you could argue. It, it, I think it's fairly easy to argue in a one on one situation to make that trade. I agree. But as soon as you start throwing in other pieces into it, you you start asking the questions. One, who is Harden gonna Harden and Lowry gonna play with? And also, you don't really have the assets to acquire somebody they could play with. 
uh, because I, I guess Houston's ask is so high that, that it makes it untenable. But I think th- from Houston's perspective, I mean, it's fair for them to actually go ahead and start looking into the market. I think the price they think Harden is worth is probably higher than what they think it is. I think. I think the return on Harden is going to be lower than what they had possibly imagined when they started doing this. And maybe the the asking price could go down um, a little bit later. I I don't know. But 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 I but I do agree with you. It, it seems like if you're able to do a one one for one swap and maybe throw in one other player, um, sure. But as soon as you start talking about OG and Fred in there. It, it just becomes like, why are you even making this trade? Because even with Harden, you're, you're like second round fodder there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, defense to start with rebounding, uh, but the half court offense that the Raptors played yesterday, uh, we commended them on getting into their hot half court sets earlier. Um, you know, a, 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 lo- a lot of action with, you know, with less than 10 seconds on the shot clock gone by. Uh, let's put it that way. Did you did you have any other observations of the of the half court offense and did you like or not not like anything? Yeah, I liked how much the ball was running through Pascal. Um simply because like people say there there's a segment of the Raptors fan base that says like take the ball out of Pascal's hand, like he struggles, whatever. But this year is still about developing your core. And so I think it makes a lot of sense to give him the ball and basically ask him to be a decision maker. And I think he made great decisions. Like he he was slinging some great passes. He was shooting without any hesitation whenever he got a little bit of space. So I like that aspect of it, just that it seems like there's a clear like indication that we're going to run a lot through him. Um, One thing I didn't like so much is I guess the way OG was utilized. Like he didn't really get any looks in the first half. And then when he did get looks, obviously he missed a bunch of wide open jumpers. And like, that's, he, he deserves criticism for that. But at the same time, you need to get him involved from the get go, especially like he's the swing player this year, in my opinion, for the Raptors. So his development is going to go a long way, but for the Raptors half court on, offense specifically. So they need to find ways to get him involved more often than not, rather than just waiting and then expecting him to hit three is when he hasn't seen the ball all game. Um, yeah, the, on, on the Siakam front, I think I've been calling for him to handle the ball a lot more because I think that's the only way he can grow. I think he needs to really feel what defenses are throwing at him. And a lot of that comes with by, you know, scanning the scene with the ball in your hand to see what's on offer. So I'm, I'm, I'm not bothered. Yesterday he had a massive turnover where like he kind of dribbled the ball and like off his foot, I think. And then JJ Redick hit a three and that was like a TSN turning point kind of deal. But even that didn't get me too mad because that's, those are the mistakes we expect Pascal to make. And we should be happy that he is actually co- confident enough to try those with the ball because last year he wasn't doing it as much. So I love the fact that Nurse put the ball in Pascal's hand and gave him some latitude to make mistakes and didn't immediately shift to like Fred or Lowry on the ball when he didn't make mistakes. And, and I, I personally thought yesterday Pascal with the ball was some of the best play I've, I've, I've seen him play, like handle the ball and, and create for his teammates. I think that'll only improve. I love that aspect. Um, in terms, in terms of what I did not like, um, I, I really think, man, like Fred is a, square peg round hole sometimes in, in, in our offense because the way he can get his shots seems to be just like step back and take deep jumpers. Those are the only clean looks that he's able to get or if somebody is creating for him and he's spotting up on his floor. But with the ball in his hand, I didn't see enough shot creation for others and I certainly didn't see enough shot creation for himself. Yeah, it is kind of funny that like we talk about putting the ball in Pascal's hands to develop him. But then when it comes to Fred, we're like, oh, I'm sick of it. And like, I'm with you. I'm sick of it, too. Like, there, it doesn't really feel like there's a reason for him to have the ball in his hands other than developing that aspect of his game. And and that's fair. Like, I think I think Baines will be good for him. Um, just like having a real screener there who can like free him up when when they run pick and roll and that was another thing I liked about last night they ran more pick and roll than we're used to seeing especially when Baines was on the court um you saw him run pick and roll and then either it was with Siakam or or Fred or Kyle and and that led to some open shots and then Boucher also was running some slipping to like the the elbow and then 
that was also a good source of offense. So the pick and roll was encouraging, but yeah, it's also with Fred, his best skill is a catch and shoot threat, but when he isn't confident in that shot, like he wasn't last night, like you said, he's not doing much for you offensively. So I think last night was a good example of a game where Norm didn't have it and Fred didn't have it at all. And they weren't doing enough defensively to warrant playing big minutes. But I mean, you can blame nurse on this, but also their bench just isn't as good as it was in previous years. So in the case where usually maybe you wouldn't want to rely on those guys so much last night, they don't really have as much as a choice this year. They kind of have to stick with their guys. Yeah. Uh, and again, it's game one. I mean, man, I feel even silly talking about some of these things after one game, but Hey, you know, like, I don't know. We love the Raptors. We like talking about them. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not overall concerned, man. I mean, losing to the Pelicans does suck, but it, this is just growth. And in my mind, I, I like convinced myself that this is a learning year. It's a growth year. And these things, we we need to just accept them. And we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to have some shitty nights where we're going to lose to some shitty teams. And mm-hmm. that's something just, you just got to accept and not be too disappointed about at least this season. I haven't um, got there myself. Uh, I still think we have a good chance of being competitive. And I think that definitely hinges on some stuff happening at the trade deadline to balance the roster a little bit more to get a guard out and get, you know, a front court player in, but yeah, I'm not there yet. Maybe that's just going to lead to me being more disappointed though. Well, speaking of the guard going out, I mean, we we have two guys now and and we have like an abundance of these, you know, tweeners uh, with, with, uh, with uh, Malachi Flynn coming on and Terrence Davis being, uh, you know, a pretty decent player in his own right. Uh, Norman Powell being there. We also have Matt Thomas, depending on how you how you view him. But Flynn versus Davis seems to be something that's going to warrant some discussion pretty soon because th- those two guys are essentially competing for very similar minutes and also happen to be similar players. You could argue that Davis is a, a little, little bit more athletic and maybe quicker, has a little bit more experience. But Flynn, in, in his limited time, has shown that he's worth investing in because the returns that that might come from him will be greater than the returns that you might come from Davis. Yeah. And this could be another one of those things where we look back on it a month from now and it's silly that we're talking about it because, you know, like I never expected Flynn to get minutes the first game of the season. That's just something the Raptors generally shy away from. Uh, They like putting guys in development spots like the G league. They like, making rookies earn every minute so that there there is like a next man up mentality and it makes sense like how you're progressing up the roster um but with that being said i i think it makes it makes more sense for flynn to be the nominal 10th man than davis for a number of reasons like people like davis's ability to get to the rim and that makes a lot of sense because the raptors are shy on those type of players but other than that I don't really see what he's bringing to the game. Like he's so, he's so just like full going forward uh, and looking at the rim and he's not very cerebral the way he plays. And it doesn't make much sense to me, given how the Raptors want to play. It requires a lot of like high IQ players. And it also makes just more sense to have as many playmakers as possible coming off the bench, because right now you have lineups where only Fred or only Kyle are the only playmakers. And, that's just hard in the modern NBA to, to be good when you only have one guy who can really make reads with the ball in his hand. Right. So for that reason, I think it makes a lot of sense eventually for Flynn to kind of overtake Davis. He, he showed a lot in the preseason. Like I know he's a rookie and I know Raptors fans like to like fawn over our draft picks, but he just made what impressed me the most. Wasn't just that he made the right reads, but like he made them quickly. He got the ball and he made a decision right then and there, like either I'm going to attack or I'm going to pass or whatever. And you need, we've needed a third point guard for a couple of years now. And he seems to be that guy. So I don't see why he doesn't win that spot soon. Uh, that's a great point regarding the quickness of the reads. Um, I, I didn't really thought, thought of that aspect, but yeah, he, he is very quick in his decision-making again, early in the clock. Uh, he makes the right pass. And also he's very confident. Like he will, he will step back and use that screen and take like a 22, 23 footer footer with, with no hesitation whatsoever. 
And that, that's something that surprised me because you, you expect a rookie to come in and kind of like ease his way into the offense, see where he fits in. But he's certainly taking a leadership role when he has a ball in his hands, which, which is surprising. But when you think about that, he's a fourth year guy out of, out of college and, and those guys are usually more mature and, and have seen more, that, that's maybe sort of to be expected. But still surprising for me how confident he was in looking for his own shot when it's available. Yeah, I I was also surprised by the defense. Like, I, I think he's already a better defensive player than Davis is. Like, Davis has the size, but he makes a lot of mistakes. And, and Flynn doesn't seem very mistake-prone at all. He seems like he has great footwork, great job maneuvering around screens, like, and great digs. Like, as someone who's going to – he's going to create some turnovers, which Davis doesn't really do. So, I think he'll win that spot. I don't think it's too much cause for concern uh, until, you know, if a couple months goes by and this is still the rotation, then um, I'd be concerned, but it's early. Yeah, I, I guess the, the, the real topic here should be like, is Davis going to steal minutes from Norm uh, more than uh, more than anything? Because again, it's just one game, but Norm looked very shaky yesterday. Very shaky. Yeah, yeah. It seems like, I hope the window hasn't gone by where his value is going to plummet because a lot of people thought the Raptors were going to try to move up in the draft by getting off norm because his value was so high last off season. And it would have made a lot of sense to kind of reshape the roster by moving him. Um, but they didn't. So now you just kind of have to hope that he refines his form because if, if he doesn't, then that's a huge value asset that you're, you're losing. Don't worry, man. The Knicks will take him. <laughs> The Knicks are always want, there. Who do we want from the Knicks, though? All right, try, that's th- three team trade. Three team trade. Somebody <laughs> yeah. else wants somebody from the Knicks. That's how it works usually with the Knicks. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, we're talking about the guards, and uh, let's talk a little bit about small ball and and where that fits into our offensive strat or defensive strategy overall. Just just to get our definitions clear, what is small ball to you? Is it OG at the five? Is, is that what we're thinking? Small ball. Small ball means. Yeah, OG and Siakam sharing the front court without mm-hmm. Boucher or or Len or um, Baines. Yeah. Okay. So do you see that being a a viable strategy? Considering also we just talked about some rebounding issues that we saw yesterday. Like where where, where do you how much do you see Nick Nurse utilizing small ball and for what reason? Yeah, I, I do see him going to it a lot more this season. Uh, we were kind of yelling about it last playoffs because Mark looked so out of shape or out of sorts and, and surge is surge. So it was kind of like, I didn't understand why he didn't go to it more, uh, especially in that game seven where he, he's kind of waits until the game, like the last four minutes of the fourth before he goes to that. I don't understand why he doesn't close the first half as well with it, especially if things aren't going so well, but also, like I said, it's super matchup dependent. And so like all these fans calling for like small ball, that's how we're going to win this year. It's like against Brooklyn. I think it's viable against Miami. I think it's viable. Um, And I, against Boston, maybe, but then you look at and beat in the Sixers, you're not playing small ball against them. You look at even Tice and um, Tristan Thompson, those guys like Thompson is a great offensive rebounder. It's going to be hard to play small ball against them. Um, and then who's the other team I'm missing? I mean, M- Miami's there. Milwaukee's there. I mean, yeah. Milwaukee, you can't wall up against Giannis with, yeah. with no real center. It's, it's really hard if you're small to wall up against Giannis. So small ball, I think matchup dependent. Yes. It's something I want to see nurse hopefully go to earlier in games when it makes sense to, but it's not a long-term solution. Like, This playoffs in the Eastern Conference is going to come down to matchups a lot, I think. And that's why, like, I think we could win a first round matchup depending on who we're matched up against. Um, But if we're going to if we're going to have to match size for size in an Embiid or in a Boston matchup, then that really limits the Raptors. Because if if we're matching size for size, that means one of our or two of our best players is sitting on the bench. That's just how the roster is shaped. Right. So. If you're matching size for size, that means Boucher is playing or Len is playing a lot and Baines is playing a lot. Whereas guys like Norm and Fred, they aren't going to be able to play as much in those matchups. So, yeah, I think I think it's a, a big concern, the Raptors front court as of right now. Um, but I think it's something that they're going to be aggressive trying to deal with at the deadline. 
Yeah, I, 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 I always thought that the team with a higher talent level dictates the type of style that's on the floor. Uh, you can't be, you can't have lower talent level and dictate style of play. You you got to have, I think, some advantage on, on, a, on a talent perspective. So when we talking about when we talk about small ball against the good teams, Milwaukee, you mentioned Boston, you mentioned even if we go down to a small ball lineup, you know those other teams can arguably put out better small ball lineups than we can. So what's the point of our small ball lineup? I think. It's it's a great strategy to throw things off and do it in quick stretches here, but to gain a competitive advantage, I, I just don't see it. Now, again, some of the some of the weaker sisters, sure, maybe, uh, you know, Orlando, yeah, go ahead, throw your small ball lineup out there. Uh, Charlotte, go nuts, but against meaningful competition, I just think it's 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 just a, it's just a little tool you have to kind of change tempo and do some things here and there, not as like an overall. Oh, we're gonna switch into small ball mode and like dominate or overcome. Like I, I don't know, I, I don't see it as like a silver bullet by any means. I think previous seasons, yeah, it, it made a lot of sense because we could switch it up. We could, teams were kind of bruised with Ibaka and Gasol in there, and then we threw in a smaller lineup, but just up the tempo even more. So now you're going up against a tired opposition, which has had to deal with two big guys. Yeah. It's a change of tempo, which can, which can go a long way, but on its own, I don't know. Yeah. That's a good point you make about talent, but I will say that our best like five players are that small ball lineup in my opinion. Yeah. So that's why it does make sense, even if some of the other teams might be able to have better small ball lineups than you. Mm-hmm. And I actually do think it could be very significant against teams like Brooklyn or Miami, where, you know, OG can straight up guard those centers. Mm-hmm. He can guard Bam and he can guard, you know, DJ. So I'm not, I'm not worried about that. And I think as long as you can put your five best players on the court, then you try to do it as much as possible. But the other thing I'll say about small ball is, is this like OG again, he's the swing player and he's really going to determine how much small ball they play because small ball just dictates a lot's going to run through OG. He's going to be the screener. He's going to be the pick and pop guy. He's going to be the pick and roll guy. We saw it a bit last night where they hedged Kyle on the pick and roll. OG got the ball like in the, in the short roll. And then he found Matt Thomas on that one corner three, but then the next play he, he looked for Matt, he was covered. And then when he tried to do, he took too long basically, and they got nothing out of it. So OG's going to have to just become like, he's going to have to take a step forward as a playmaker. He's going to have to be a reliable pick and pop guy. He's going to be the swing player who, if he can just like take a step forward and like be a legitimately good five in this league, then they might actually have a chance in some of those matchups where, where the, the other teams are smaller. Man, I, I honestly think we need an entire one hour of the show just dedicated to OG because people expect so much of the guy and yeah. he has so long to go in so many aspects of the game that it just feels like wh- whenever we talk about OG, I see like, oh, OG at the five doing this, OG hitting threes, OG creating, OG doing all this. I'm like, man, this guy has a lot of raw elements to his game, which he needs to sort out, you know, more than Siakam does, obviously. Uh, so, I mean, the, if, if you look at time horizon where Siakam reaches his peak and OG reaches his peak, OG has ways to go. And OG also doesn't benefit from the fact that in the Raptors offense, we look for OG naturally less than we look for some of the other players. And last night, was if, if last night is any indication of what Nick Nurse thinks of OG's offense, and again, preface this, but it's only one game, uh, you know, o, OG will not get as many touches as you might think to, to, to mature his game in, 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 a, in, a, in, in a single season. Yeah. Yeah. Me and Samson were talking about this uh, in one of his weekly podcasts where he was, he read Nick nurse's book and was saying there was one part where OG set where nurse has like a thing where he wants OG to bring the ball up sometimes, but Fred won't give it to him. So he came to nurse in the lobby of the hotel one time and he just said, he's still not doing it. <laughs> so that was like his way of confronting the issue. But yeah, like like you said, even if nurse does want OG to get more looks, the Raptors offense is so free flowing that it doesn't necessarily matter. Like the players are going to dictate, like the players with the ball in their hands, like Fred and Kyle, they're going to dictate who really gets the ball. So there's nothing sometimes the nurse can do about it unless he wants to, create like a more structured offense which doesn't seem to be in his plans but yeah like I agree with you that 
the OG narrative and dialogue is a little ridiculous. And I just fell prey to it saying like the only way the Raptors can really compete is if he does take that step. I still believe that's the case, but I don't know if he will take it. And I think like some of the people who are saying like, Oh, geez, going to be better than Siakam this year. Like that was a real thing going around Raptors Twitter. And it's like, in what world do you live in that pe- that people take these steps naturally like just because Siakam did it doesn't mean we can expect literally anyone else to and like Siakam is so far ahead of OG in so many ways that I don't get why people think that he's even close to being the player I think another problem is with like NBA discourse is people equate defense and offense as being equally valuable where when they're just not like OG is a better defender yes but defense is not worth as much as offense well yeah no N- not in today's NBA, for sure. Uh, I think offense is definitely always... Ha- offense generally is just more valuable. I mean, but yeah, I mean, defense's importance has sort of declined because because the three-point shot basically says, take more threes and you'll make up for what you might give up on offense if you're giving up two. If you're giving up twos on defense, make it up with threes. Yeah, the general argument I'm talking about. Um, yeah, but, but I 100% agree. I, I think OG... We are oversubscribing to the potential of OG. And whoever said that OG has a higher ceiling than Siakam, I think that was a legitimate question to ask maybe two years ago. I mean, two, three years ago, maybe that was a valid question to ask. At this point, um, I, I don't see that even being a being a thing, but you know, I'm open to be surprised. Um, let's finish off uh, this discussion with uh, some contention talk. We talked earlier about uh, Siakam and Harden possibly swapping, and that would kind of, in some people's eyes, accelerate the Raptors' course towards contention. But given the current roster, assuming that trade doesn't happen, what is the roadmap to contention that you see? And, and by contention, I mean like you know a legitimate threat to make it to the NBA Finals. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to say. Um... It's hard to say also because it looks like the East got a little bit better uh, in general. Like Brooklyn looks scary. Uh, Philly got better. Boston, I'm not sold on, but Miami got better just because their young guys are, are a year older. So I don't think I would be shocked. You know, this year, it seems like we're a, a little bit away from those top teams right now. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not, I think there's a, a, reason to be optimistic though because there is still a number of ways that the raptors can improve this roster in the short term whether it's the trade market this year you know like norm is a guy who has a player option next year that he'll probably not pick up but we're not sure so the raptors there's a lot of reason for them to want to get off him just to ensure their cap flexibility and at the, at the trade deadline, we'll have a better idea about if they're going to be buyers or sellers. So whether they're going to maybe trade Norm for a first round pick, or if they're going to try to trade Norm for a guy who can help them compete now, like an expiring wing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's also free agency. So, so going back to the trade deadline, we have all our first round picks, right? So that's encouraging because that's just like, there's a lot of ways to kind of balance the roster by trading guards and trading picks and and getting a guy who can be like, first of all, like a center who we can actually have for a long term. Right now we have no real long term, um, you know, sure thing at the center spot. So that would be a nice thing to maybe go after this uh, trade deadline. And then free agency, like, yeah. Um, Giannis is off the board and Kawhi is probably not coming back to Toronto. I think we can agree on that, but there's a bunch of really good players who, who would fit the Raptors system. Um, even if it's like for shorter deals and I could list them, like there's, there's guys like PJ Tucker, like Marcus Aldridge, depending on if he still has like a couple of years left in him. <laughs> Did you say PJ Tucker on a road to contention? <laughs> PJ Tucker's good, man. <laughs> I don't know. His third stint in Toronto is going to be the content, the contention uh, roadmap. I don't yeah, know. I'm not sure, but I will say like the Raptors, I think contrary to popular belief are becoming a destination where guys want to play. So even though it might not seem like it, cause Serge and Mark left, they didn't really leave because they wanted to leave. They left because the Raptors didn't offer them the deal that they wanted, at least in Serge's case. 
So I think there's guys who want to play in Toronto and it's just a matter of time before that actually happens. I, I'm not pessimistic like a lot of Raptors fans are um, about our chances of landing like a real guy. Uh, I, I can probably, not in this episode, but I can probably debate you well on on that topic uh, because the only thing that we have to make that argument when we say guys want to play in Toronto is the actual evidence of free agents signing or re-signing in Toronto. Everything else is circumstantial and hearsay, really. Uh, so, but but I'll I'll put that one aside. But but I do want to offer a solution to how we can maximize the uh, our, our draft picks, which you alluded to uh, the, the the first round draft picks we have. What about when we trade those draft picks to other teams? Part of an innovative package of the deal would be Masai would actually help you draft with that pick once that pick is on yeah. your team. I mean, one. it's almost like the Raptors as a consultancy to other NBA teams. You know, nobody's done that. It's it's not it's it's something which is sounds kind of weird, but that could be one way you could actually borrow from other teams and increase the t- the, the, the trade value. I, I don't know if that's legal or whatever it is, but it's, it's not legal. I don't think so. No. I mean, why not? I mean, why why would you not just? It, it's a it's a consulting contract. I think it's tampering, some sort of tampering. No, tra- tampering is when you when you try to steal existing players under contract over. This is not right. tampering. This is more of a extra service we provide. I know, but doesn't tampering fall into any like way that you're helping? At, like I don't know. I if don't you're know. helping another team get better, that just okay. can't be legal. That's tampering. Oh, okay. I don't know. I don't know, man. I'm just I'm just spitballing. But yeah, uh, yeah, like the thing about Masai drafting is real though because. Imagine if the Raptors can get like a lottery pick. That's that's where like I'm like excited because like that's one option is trading for the future, trading the load up in the draft. Um, and that's exciting because if you get like a couple picks in like the middle of the first round, especially the next two years when the draft is supposedly loaded, that could that could get you there. All right. Uh I I don't have any fantastic ideas of rebuilding a contender, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, we have some assets and it's on the trade market. Uh, I, I would love to see guys like uh, somebody like Brandon Ingram, for example, uh, show up in Toronto through some Maasai wizardry. Um, but, you know, b- besides that, I don't, I, don't, I don't really have any great ideas. Uh, I think the assets that we can kind of ship out now include Norman Powell and possibly Terrence Davis as well, and a couple of picks. And I think that should get you fairly, um, you know, something in return. I'm not completely married to Fred Van Vliet, to be honest with you. Like, I mean, I, I, I like the guy. I like his hustle and all that. But if he got shipped tomorrow out of Toronto, would I like shed a tear? No, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't do that for pretty much any player. Maybe Siakam I would and, and OG uh, a little bit. But other than that, I mean, I go ahead and take him. I don't care. Yes, name. Siakam's the one guy to me who I think would be hard to ship out, which is probably why the hard end deal yeah. is likely not to happen. He's just like the guy with the highest upside and it would be hard to to justify trading him, especially after dealing to Mar. What's hard about trading Siakam is that you don't know what his ceiling is. It was very comfortable to trade DeMar because you knew where that was going. Uh, with Siakam, you genuinely don't know even at this point. So it, there's always a big, big uh, risk in, in in touching his contract, especially when he's signed to a you know a, a long term deal. So mm-hmm. you know it's it's. Uh, I'm glad we have the some some good people trying to make that uh, decision. Yeah, the last thing I'll say about like rebuilding a championship contender is like people say like. I don't know, like, there's no one out there, like, who will... The NBA is in constant flux, right? Like, right now, it's James Harden, okay? And that he doesn't make the most sense for us, even though we'll still consider it. But, like, a couple months from now, it might be Bradley Beal. A couple months from now, it'll be someone else. And, like, the Raptors have put themselves in a really good position to trade for that player. And right now, it's hard to trade anyone but Siakam just because OG and Fred both got re-signed. But at the trade deadline, it becomes a lot easier to trade Fred, like you said. And so I'm confident as long as Masai is in the front office that we're we're in a good position. Oren, uh, thanks for coming on the show, man. Uh, would love to have you back on to continue this conversation uh, after maybe more than one game is played so we have more data to parse over. But uh, thanks for coming on, man. Yeah, indeed. I had fun. Thank you.